So chapter 22 is called The Origin of Species. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about microevolution and macroevolution. We'll talk about different species concepts and interspecies hybrids, and then pre- and post-zygotic barriers to producing interspecies hybrids. We'll talk about types of speciation and the hybrid zone. So um, we talked about microevolution in the previous chapter when we talked about the hardy weinberg conditions. So microevolution is a change in allele frequency in a population over time. Macroevolution is really taking those things that lead to microevolution um, and kind of amplifying it a little bit. So this is the evolutionary changes that create new species and or groups of species. Um, this tends to happen over a longer period of time, but it doesn't always. Um, but really what we can think of with macroevolution is that this is the type of evolution that separates gene pools. So we're not saying that a frog and a gator get together and produce a frog a gator or a frog a dial, right? Um, and we're not saying that a chimpanzee turned into a human. Um, really what we're looking at here with the chimpanzee human thing is that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor, right? Um, so don't get that confused. Um, and then, you know, there's varying estimates on how many total species there are, but one estimate says that there's like 8.7 million species, plus or minus 1.3 million. If you were off in your drawer, in your cash, or in your cash register drawer, by 1.3 million, would you get fired? I would get fired, right? So that estimate is pretty variable because there's still species we haven't discovered yet, um, and we're still classifying and organizing species, so keep that in mind. Um, so this next one here, um, your family tree is not a straight line from your grandfather to your father to you, and evolution isn't a line from a salamander to a cat to you. Um, rather what we're saying is that, um, you've got your parents and you share a common ancestor with your siblings, which would be your parents. So on the cat and the human, there's the common ancestor of mammals at that point. Um, then you don't just have one grandparent, you've got two sets. Um, you know, you've got two grandmas and two grandpas. Um, and then they're the common ancestor between you and your cousins. So kind of keep that in mind. We're also not saying like, you know, human is first place, cat is second place, and then the salamander or amphibian is third place. So keep that in mind there as well. So speciation is what we're talking about in this particular chapter. So speciation is the development of a new species. This is another one of those questions that I throw to you on the test and I think it's going to go well and it's usually always in the frequently missed area. So speciation is just development of a new species. However, saying what a species is, that's a lot more complicated. Um, so defining a species is tricky. Um, and typically biologists are going to use things like morphological characteristics, so what things look like, can they interbreed, um, molecular features like similarities between DNA and RNA and proteins, um, ecological factors like where do they live, and evolutionary history. Um, the classic speciation hypothesis is that you have isolated populations, they diverge, and then there's secondary contact where they are no longer considered the same species. As far as what happens with the divergence, um, those are any of the microevolutionary processes that we talked about in the previous chapter. So um, natural selection, sexual selection, mutation, that sort of thing. So if we look here, um, at first glance, you might say, that's a whole lot of bears over there. Um, but we look here, and you're like, those are dogs. Um, to me, that Great Dane and that Chihuahua look pretty different. but um, both of those dogs are the same biological species. Um, and then over there on the bear side of things, there's actually eight biological species shown there. So defining what a species is and isn't is kind of a tricky task. Um, so one of the concepts we can use to define what a species is, is the biological species concept. Um, this defines a species as a group of populations that have the potential to interbreed and can produce viable, so living and fertile, offspring, so their offspring can have offspring as well. Um, and they have to be reproductively isolated from other groups. So 
man, there are some limitations to this. What about organisms that only reproduce asexually, like bacteria? They're not interbreeding with anyone. So how do we define them? What about organisms that require other organisms to reproduce? Um, or what about organisms that could interbreed but don't, but like we throw them in captivity and they can interbreed? Are they the same species? Are they not? Who knows? And then how can you tell what an extinct species even bred with, right? That is complicated. Um, so we're going to go with the biological species concept to define species in our class. However, there are definitely some limitations. Other species concepts include the evolutionary lineage concept, which says species should be defined based on um, separate evolutionary lineages. Ecological species concept says each species occupies a distinct niche, um, meaning they have habitat that they use and they use it in a certain way um, and they influence the environment as well. So it's defining species based on how they use their habitat, basically. So when we define species, um, sometimes you're like, mm, those are kind of close, but not too close, or they're kind of the same, but not too the same. Um, so if we look at the separation time for two populations, if they've only been separated a short time, they're likely to be similar and likely to be considered the same species. But if they've been separated for a longer period of time, they're more likely to show um, some pretty substantial differences. Um, in some situations where you're like, that's pretty different, um, but it's hard to determine if they're truly different species, you could use a subspecies classification. So when we talk about speciation, which again is just creating a new species, um, the underlying cause of speciation is the accumulation of genetic changes that ultimately promote enough differences so we can say those are two different populations now and those are different. So macroevolution leads to speciation and this is just separating gene pools or separating populations. There's two kinds of speciation that we can talk about, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. With allopatric speciation, um, allopatric literally means other country, so this occurs with a geographic barrier, so it requires that there's some sort of barrier between population A and population B, um, and with that barrier, um, they're no longer sharing their genetic material and they're no longer interbreeding and species A um, becomes distinct from species B. Sympatric speciation um, means um, speciation occurs without the presence of a geographic barrier. This means together country. So in this case, um, species A and species B are in the same area, but something occurred and species B can no longer mate with species A. So I think it can be kind of hard to think about sympatric speciation because you're like, how did that happen? How did they get different enough? Um, so we've talked about this before, but plants are more tolerant of polypoidy, which is when an organism has two or more sets of chromosomes. Um, so the species B here in our row of uh, different flowers there, um, species B is actually a fertile tetrapoid hybrid between species A and species C. Um, so species B can produce its own um, offspring that look like it, but species B originally formed when species A and species C um, interbred. So they produced an interspecies hybrid. So uh, the picture to the right is an example of which kind of speciation. If we look at the picture, um, there's the mountain range there and the populations are diverging and on secondary contact they are different enough that um, they do not interbreed. So that would be allopatric speciation. And then number four, plants are more likely than animals to undergo which kind of speciation? That would be sympatric speciation. Why? Because they're more tolerant of polyploidy and so um, they're more likely to produce um, viable, fertile, interspecies hybrids. So, how do we get um, the separation of gene pools? There's got to be some sort of reproductive isolating mechanisms. Um, so, mechanisms that prevent interspecies hybrids from forming and prevent interbreeding between different species are these reproductive isolating mechanisms. So, barriers can either be Prezygotic, so before a zygote forms, recall that a zygote is just a fertilized egg, 
or they could be post-zygotic, so they happen after zygote formation. And we'll talk about all of these coming up here. So a prezygotic um, isolating mechanism is habitat isolation. So this is when geographic barriers prevent contact. So if they're literally not in the same area, they can't mate, they can't interbreed, so they would be different species. So there are no wild ligers or tigons because um, in the wild, the range of the lion and the range of the tiger do not overlap and never did. So temporal isolation, temporal means time. Um, like you can tell the passing of time by looking at a person because they're hair starts to gray at the temples, right? So temporal isolation is time. So in this case, organisms are going to reproduce at different times of the day or different times of the year. So if you're not reproductively active at the same time, then you're not going to have offspring together. Um, behavioral isolation, so there's sometimes behaviors that are important in mate choice, like songs or dances. So there's a couple pictures there showing um, courtship dance in the albatross. So if they don't do the right song or dance, they are not getting a mate and they are not reproducing. So that's still prezygotic because that's before the zygote forms. Um, mechanical isolation is another prezygotic isolating mechanism. Um, so this is when you have um, size or incompatible genitalia that prevents mating. If the parts do not fit, they cannot mate. So the damselfly is an example of that. The picture above um, the little box there is actually different damselfly genitalia. Um, so they're, they can be very different. Another prezygotic isolating mechanism is gametic isolation. So in this case, the gametes um, do not unite successfully. This is important for species that release their gametes into the water or into the air. For example, um, in sea urchins, you can see in the picture there, there's um, sea urchins that look pretty different, but they're obviously close together. Um, they're going to release their gametes into the water column and their gametes are likely to meet, but the egg is not fertilized because there's not the correct receptor on the sperm in the egg if it's the wrong species. So that brings us to postzygotic barriers. So remember, postzygotic is after zygote formation. So postzygotic barrier would be hybrid sterility. So um, donkeys and horses, which are different species, can interbreed and produce mules, which are something that is real. This is not a mythical creature, right? Um, but donkeys have a diploid chromosome number of 66. Horses have a diploid chromosome number of 60, and the mule's diploid chromosome number is 63, so they are going to be viable, meaning they live, but they are going to be sterile and unable to successfully reproduce. The next two I don't really have pictures for because there's not really good pictures for it. Um, in hybrid inviability, um, the fertilized egg cannot progress past the early embryo form, so a zygote forms, right, an egg is fertilized, but it doesn't make it very far. Or with hybrid breakdown, um, that is when interspecies hybrids are viable and fertile, but subsequent generations have genetic abnormalities. So occasionally a female liger or tigon could be bred back to a male lion or tigon, um, but they've got, um, they have chromosome abnormalities and they are unhealthy. So hybrid breakdown, or sometimes this is called F2 breakdown as well, because this would be the F2 generation. So there are no ligers in the wild. List one prezygotic and one postzygotic reason why. So prezygotic before zygote formation, they are not going to be in the same area. So habitat isolation would be a prezygotic reason. And postzygotically, um, ligers tend to be sterile. So hybrid in um, hybrid sterility would be the example there. Um, number four, then, different firefly species use different flashing patterns to attract mates. Is this pre or postzygotic? Well, it is going to be before the zygote forms, so that's prezygotic. And then what kind of isolation is this? This is behavioral isolation. So smaller isolated populations um, are often more likely to form new species. Um, so if a small population moves to a new location that is geographically separated, natural selection could rapidly alter the genetic composition of that population, um, leading to adaptation to that new environment, 
Or you can have adaptive radiation where a single species evolves into an array of descendants that differ greatly in their habitat, um, their form, or their behavior, or some combination of all three of those. Um, also, interspecies hybrids, even though we talked about different reproductive isolating mechanisms, interspecies hybrids do sometimes form. Um, so gene flow can occur between distinct species and hybrid zones where they both are occurring. For example, grizzly bears and polar bears um, can mate and produce. ARPA calls them growler bears, but some people call them pizzly bears, which I think is a better name. Either way, I hope that I never meet one in the wild. That would be terrifying. Um, but since the grizzly bears range and the polar bears range is beginning to overlap, um, it's creating a hybrid zone where we're more likely to get roller bears or pizzlies. So chapter 22 really focused on macroevolution, but it's important that you understand both micro and macro evolution. So micro evolution is on the population level. Macro evolution is on the species level. Um, we talked about the biological species concept. So to be a biological species, you need to interbreed, produce a viable, so living and fertile offspring so the offspring can produce their own offspring. Um, interspecies hybrids are a hybrid between two species like that growler bear or prisley bear um, but usually that's prevented with pre or post zygotic reproductive isolation mechanisms or barriers um, and then we talked about sympatric and allopatric speciation and how plants are a little bit more likely to do sympatric speciation because they're more tolerant of polyploidy and then we talked about forming growler bears in the hybrid zone um, I do want to tell you, though, that this pre- and post-zygotic barriers um, make really good kind of scenario-type questions on the exam. Uh, so that is it for Chapter 22.